you all for coming in this horrific wind. Um, I'm president of the Victor Heritage Society. This is my name is Cecil Shaker. I think I know everybody here in the room. Um, we have a passionate group, board, member, board members that are very passionate. And so we've been very excited to uh, re-energize the Victor Heritage Society. I'll introduce all of our officers. We have Marilyn Fay. Well, let's give it just a minute here. And just as a disclaimer, we are recording this, but it's just recording this way, but if you talk, we might hear you. Okay, I'll go ahead and continue. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Sue Kochaver. I'm the Victor Heritage Society president. Marilyn Fay, who actually was one of the founding members of the Victor Heritage Society, is now our vice president. And uh, we have Sheila Stanley here. She is the treasurer and membership coordinator. Melissa Blessing, who has a house. Where's Melissa Blessing's house? North 7th. North 7th. She is our secretary. Doug McNeil is our website coordinator and corresponding secretary. We have Judy Sandlin. She's our, uh, she does our heritage calendar. With LeJean. With LeJean. With LeJean. Uh, we put this out every year. Newmont helps to sponsor it. Uh, these are $10. And we have some out here if anybody wants to get a calendar. Um, and then we have Lachin Greeson, who can I turn her around? Oh, hi everyone. Hello. She's saying hello to everybody. She is our photo yeah. artist. Yeah. Yeah. Probably your house sometime. Yeah, they, perhaps they give you a little bit of somewhere to go. Yeah, that would oh, be good. I already got cards in the ball. Turn his face on now, too. All right, Grace, we'll take How care. How we can definitely talk to each other. But, um, yeah, you're welcome. I'm, I'm going to mute you, uh, Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn. <laughs> Uh, Lachine also has, um, and we have Anne Horton, who is a board member, and she is a long time, her relatives, how many, how many generations? Uh, generations aren't long, but yes. long yes. Yeah. So, yeah. And Anne, <laughs> hey. you know, she's born in the 1880s, that's yeah. kind of weird. So Anna has joined our board and we welcome, we're very passionate that she's with us too. Um, but uh, Lejean has the Facebook page, My Obsessions, Family History, Victor, Colorado. So if you're on Facebook, Lejean's the one that uh, is the manager of that page. And she always provides us with great info. So I just, before we start with Frankie, I wanted to tell you about our calendars. These are also available at no charge. And this is something that we've done. Uh, we did it years ago and we just reprinted them this year. So if you want one of these, please feel free to pick one up. It's the architecture of the homes. And of course, we have membership forms for the Victor Heritage Society. For $10 a year, an individual can join and a family at 20. So if anybody wants to join, we'd love to have you. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing this year. Uh, you know, we usually have our uh, historical home tours 
during gold rush days. We are going to have Richard Corson um, do, in lieu of that, he is going to put a display together and uh, we'll let you know where that will be and when it will be during gold rush days. We're moving the heritage out home tours to a special weekend. Uh, we think we need a whole three days to celebrate Victor Heritage. So September 6th through the 8th, we'll have LeJean here. She's gonna be doing uh, a presentation in the Historic Gold Coin Club on Friday night. Saturday, we're kind of unsure of the schedule yet. We're gonna have a round table discussion. We want some of the old timers to join. The borough race will be happening that weekend. And then house tour, house tour. The house tour is in the afternoon. On Sunday, we're gonna have a little memorial out at our World War II memorial. Steve Plute is going to be talking about the gold star. Um, on the wall. And then after that, we're all going to go to bison and hopefully have a picnic. So, and we'll talk about the bison history. So we really want to have just enmesh ourselves in Victor Heritage for that weekend. What else are we doing that I forgot? Baseball game, you said that. We'll do it. Oh, in the, the vintage baseball tournaments will be here June 22nd and 23rd. Again, at the historic Gold Bowl. And um, I think that's it for now. That's all I can think of. Think of. So, but we're always looking for pictures for our calendar. So if anybody has pictures, please, um, let's get them donated. And, and it, uh, LaJean and Judy go through them and put these beautiful calendars together. And, and we will be participating in the parade on gold rush days so at noon yeah yeah and we meet at my house so and she lives and right in, there on victor avenue getting costume anyway so welcome and without further ado we're going to introduce miss frankie ashton she uh was a deputy clerk at teller county clerk and recorder at the teller county courthouse for seven years and so we wanted to bring her in because we want her to teach us how to do more research on the house. And I have to tell you an interesting fact about my house. I live on 2nd and Spicer on the corner. LaJean just sent me a picture of my house from 1899. It was one of the houses that was not destroyed, I guess, in the fire. And... Um, Josiah Small, his wife was Ella. They lived in that house. And after the great Victor fire, he wrote a letter to Ella telling her about the destruction of Victor. And uh, I'm gonna hopefully, LaJean, I think we need to get that out because this year the Victor Fire Department is celebrating 130 years, I think it is. And so we need to get that letter out because he talks about what the destruction looked like. Josiah Small was, um, uh, he works with the Victor Bank and also with the Woods Investment Company. I never knew he lived in my house. I figured somebody was living in there with me right now, <laughs> but I didn't know it could have been Josiah. So that was kind of interesting. So anyway, without further ado, Frankie, please. Hi, everybody. So I see a lot of friendly faces this evening. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Frankie Ashton, and I have the honor and privilege of owning two historic homes on South 2nd. Um, and as Sue was saying, I served as deputy clerk and recorder for seven years for Teller County. 
So what does that really mean? Um, so as a clerk, I just process paperwork. That's not the fun part. But as a recorder, I am the keeper of the real estate records from March 23rd of 1899, when we formed as a county, up until present day. And so why it's important that you know that date, March 23rd, 1899, is because a lot of us have homes that predate Teller County. So if you were in Victor proper or Goldfield, we were El Paso County previous to March of 1899. So if you're doing a historical search, Teller County can get you back to that date. And then anything before that, you're actually going down to Colorado Springs. And I've not gotten the pleasure of going yet, but I hear it's on microfiche. So, um, but I can easily explain to you what that search looks like on our side. So things to know, how many people are familiar with the Teller County Assessor's website? Okay, a few of you. If you are not, I highly suggest hopping on, and it really as simple as Googling Teller County Assessor's Office, because you can do a property search and you can pull your property by your physical address or by your last name. And then it's gonna show you a picture of your property. And then more importantly, as you scroll down, it's gonna give you your legal description. So your legal description is very, very important when you do a search. So you know what property you're searching for. So we all know our houses as the physical address that's been assigned. Thank you, Steve. Steve actually has a copy of an old property card from the Teller County Assessor's Records. Um, and now it's all digitalized and, and you can look it up from home. Um, but knowing your legal description or your lot block in subdivision, and I know that sounds funny because yes, we live within City of Victor, but it has been subdivided into different Neighborhood. So there's the Spicer edition, the Cunningham edition, West Victor. So there's many different subdivisions that make up City of Victor. So just to give you an idea, the house I live in actually has two legal descriptions because my house crosses a boundary. So I'm lot 11, block 27, City of Victor, but I am also lot 11, block 27, Spicer edition to the City of Victor because my house literally sits on the line of both of those subdivisions. So you'll wanna look that up because that's gonna give you your legal description and your year build. People get confused often because they'll see adjusted year build. The assessor is going to add an adjusted year build anytime a house goes under a major renovation. So for example, my house was built in 1912. The adjusted year build is 1944. And so if I had to guess, maybe they were changing plumbing, they added different electrical, they did something very major to that house in 44 to adjust that date. But go by your original build date because that's how far back you obviously wanna go. If you wanna know every person who's ever owned your home, that is the way to go. So you'll wanna get that first, get your legal description and your year build. Then from there, you wanna go over to the Teller County Courthouse and see the clerk and recorder's office because the clerk and recorder, they're the keeper of the records. So it's almost like a real estate library, if you will. And when you go in, you're going to see a series of beautiful giant books all in the shelves on the rollers. Those are the historical real estate documents. There's even mining patents in there. Um, and it's insane because you said, Steve, you know this, you can actually see where the president signed off on mining patents. So um, what you would do first is you want to start with yourself and you're actually going backwards through the chain of title because obviously, you know, you'll be able to find your record first. So whenever we go in as recorders, we're going to index like a librarian. So when you do a search, last name, first name, and less is more. So even though I told you, write down your year build, write down your legal description. When you sit down at a public computer, your best bet is just put your name in first because anything that's ever been recorded in your name is gonna pop up. What you're looking for is a deed. And so that is why I made this cheat sheet with know your terminology because there are many different deeds. There, here we go. Um, sure. Thank you. There are warranty deeds, and usually those are, it implies that there's a clear title or it's gone through um, a title company. Most of us that have financed our homes, we close through a title company, so you'll probably see a warranty deed. And that deed is going to show two parts. 
grantor, who is your seller, and the grantee, who is the buyer. So typically, you're going to see yourself named as grantee. Well, you want to figure out who you bought that house from, right? So you're looking for the grantor. So you write their name down, and the very next search you do is going to be their name. And now the same thing's going to pop up. Anything that's been recorded, mortgages, deeds, you'll see that come up in their name. So on and so forth on the computer. You'll just continue to put in last name, first name of your grantor or your seller. So on the electronic side, um, those records are only searchable back until about 1986. So I always advise that people go over to the assessor's office, which is directly across the hall from the clerk and recorder, and ask for a property card because those were handwritten cards that will close the gap from the 1980s, generally into the early 70s, sometimes even into the late 60s. So it'll give you a list of transfers or documents, a list of deeds, and it'll either give you one of two things, a reception number. So anytime a document is reported for public record, a six digit number is assigned, a document number essentially. And so they'll give you the six digit reception number or they'll give you a book and page. And you can actually search on the computer either way. You can put a document number in, and by the way, reception number and document number, interchangeable terms. So you can put in that six digit number and click search and it'll pull you the document specific, or you can go in and enter your book and page and hit search and it's gonna pull that specific document. And so why I gave you this list of terms is a lot of people when they do research, they get themselves caught in a rabbit hole because they're like, well, I'm finding this deed of trust. I'm finding, well, a deed of trust is a type of mortgage that is backed by the Teller County Public Trustee. Chances are, you, maybe you're interested in how much your house was financed for a few years ago, but most people want the deeds. They wanna see the transfer of ownership because they're more interested in who bought this house from whom at what time? And that's another interesting one. All deeds are dated. The, they have the date of the transaction on the actual deed, and then they'll have a recording stamp of when that was recorded for public record, right down to the minute. I mean, you'll see them that say 10.02 a.m., you know, January 11th, 2021. I mean, there's literally right down to the second that the office took it in. Um, so... Once you get into those older records, you'll use your property card like Steve had a copy of. You can put those all in. Well, then you get through the property card and gee, now what do I do? That's where the giant books are gonna come in. So you will notice on the far wall behind the computers all the way to the left, it's almost like I've been in this office, you guys. Um, all the way to the left, if you look at the books, you're gonna see the grand tour and grantee indexes. They're going to be alphabetized by last name and they're going to have a date range on them. So that way you can see what transfers happen within this date range between these parties. So that way, again, chances are you're really going to go through, okay, well, I found this person bought from this person. So for me, it's been easier to really do the brand tour search because if you know who the buyer was, you can usually get back pretty fast, but it never hurts to search by seller as well. And because we've had people come in the office and say, oh, my uncle sold a house in the 70s. Well, now we know to look in the grantee index. Like, okay, well, let's see when he sold it. And, or, or grantor, sorry, or he bought. He bought a house in the 70s. Well, he's going to be the grantee. So we can find him by his last name, by that date range, and as a grantee or buyer. So as you're going backwards, that first wall is going to get you back to, I want to say, 1949. No, it might go a little earlier, but you'll go back even more if you're, depending on how old your house is. So there's a giant island in the middle of the office. Well, the portion that is facing the DMV counter, if you've ever been in that office and registered a car, you've seen that island. Well, then the older grantee books, those are actually going to cover 19 or I'm sorry, 1899 through 1947. So yes, the wall will start at 47 um, and then go through, I believe, December of 1980. 
So you really have got a full range of documents you can look up. Now, most of us that live here in town, whether you have a commercial building or a residential, you're going to be searching by a legal description. You're going to have a lot, lot subdivision. But in the case that you have vacant land and you have a mining claim or a load, L-O-D-E, which is just another name for a mining parcel, a lot of people want to look up that original patent. They want to find out well, when was this patented. And we even have records for some reason El Paso let us keep because some of them are dated from the 1880s, which were obviously before we formed this county. But if you want to do that, that actually is your, you'll have the name of your mining claim and you will also have what is called a section township and range or a meets and bounds. So essentially it's a tract of land and there's a grid system. And so you've got your section, your township and your range and that will literally, so for example, if you were to hire someone to come and do a land survey, your surveyor uses those coordinates to locate that exact tract of land. And those are tracked obviously very heavily, um, not only by property owners, but by Newmont. I, I mean, it goes on and on. They're, they're very specific. So if you do have a piece of land with a mining claim, you can search by the name of that mining claim. And interesting story, I searched my own home and I found out as I was going backwards, the very center that we're standing in was once the Lutheran church and the pastor lived in my house. So it was a very short commute. He only had to walk a block down to come to church. And so the Swedish Lutheran church owned my house for about 20 years. So as I was going backwards, I was like, oh, the Swedish, what, the Vicky Center? So I put it all together. Um, but I've used other means as well. So for our side at Clerk and Lake Porter, we're gonna give you all the transfers, all of the deeds. And what's really fun, you guys, if you come in the office and ask the girls, the old deeds, we photocopy them out of these giant books and they'll print them off at 11 by 17, like a poster size for you. And I have them, the older deeds so that I could frame them and put them in my mudroom. So when I got all the way back, the very first owner I could find, I, and I noticed a lot of them, they abbreviated their names at the turn of the century. So it was E.H. Newland. And I thought, wow, who is E.H. Newland? And maybe a year ago, one of my neighbors catches me driving up the alleyway. She goes, Frankie, Frankie, there is someone looking for you. Their great grandfather owned your house. I said, was that last name Newland? And she said, it was. And it turned out it was Lori Newland Lorenz. And she is on the Jean's page. And she happens to be a children's book author. So she wrote about Edward Harvey Newland and had her niece illustrate this book and my house is in it with original photos, the whole story of Mr. Newland. Apparently he was quite the businessman and he owned the Newland block, which is the next block up at 2nd and uh, Victor Ave. So the group of buildings that are now apartments, they're directly across from the Ag and Mining Museum. Those were Mr. Newland's. And so she and he met Teddy Roosevelt. There's pictures of him with the president in the book. So I'm working with her to hopefully get several of these that we can put in the museum and sell. But it was amazing because she provided me with pictures of the house. I mean, I couldn't believe it. So much so that I'm about to go to the Teller County Assessor with proof that my house was not built in 1912. I have pictures of it from 1902. So it is older than what even the county believes it is. Um, so it's really interesting, like you go through and you can learn about, you know, the history through deeds, but another great one I found is Ancestry.com. You can go through the old U.S. censuses that way, the Sanborn fire maps I found to be very helpful. They'll give you so much information, and that was another reason I suspected my house was older. It was showing up on Sanborn fire maps much previous to 1912. So it was very, it was very neat. And when you get in contact with other history buffs, we all pull together like this really fun group of people that we are. <laughs> and thank you, Lejean. Because when I bought the second house, I knew nothing about it. And I thought, okay, well, I can search the deeds, but I want to know the fun stuff. So I posted a picture of it on the My Obsessions Family History Facebook page. And within minutes, 
Lejean got me in contact with Anna, who was already my friend, who, and I won't cry telling our story, Anna, but Anna explained to me that that was her family's home for generations. And she sent me a plethora of pictures and I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. I, I could tell by the pictures exactly where in the house they were taken. It was absolutely incredible. And my favorite part was Anna called me and said, well, <laughs> sorry, Anna, I'm gonna make you cry. It's your Aunt Rita, correct? So her Aunt Rita was up this summer. She's 90 years old and she grew up in this house. And so I had the honor and privilege. I told Anna, I said, we're furnishing it. I'm staging it to put it on as a rental. But if she, if she doesn't mind coming into a work of progress, let's show her the house. And we brought Rita in. And what was it? Maybe an hour. She walked around and she went from room to room. And she, I could tell she was seeing that house as it sat 70 years ago. And she was explaining to me where the phone was on the wall, where my dining room was their family's library, that six kids were raised in that house. Six kids were raised in this three bedroom house. Yeah, one boy and five girls. <laughs> And I think there was not a dry eye in the house when she stood in the bathroom in front of the original claw foot that has always been there. And she kind of put her hands down on the pedestal sink and said, 70 years ago, my dad stood in the kitchen and looked at me and told me how beautiful I looked in, in my prom dress. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. I think we all started crying. And that, I think, is really what has been beautiful and amazing one of my neighbors once said that we aren't just homeowners, we're stewards of history. And that really resonated with me. I really, that really touched me deeply because I think of it that way. And now knowing um, several times, I've been out working in the yard and I've scared people because they've pulled up and they're pointing at the house. And so a gentleman rolled down his window and he said, I'm really sorry, it's just my family lived here in the seventies and eighties. And I said, you're Paul Downs Jr., right? And he was stunned. And he said, do you want a tour? Come see the house. So he jumped out, and but he was able to give me a lot of insight into what had changed even in the last you know, 30 years. So that was pretty amazing. Um, so I would highly recommend that anybody who is curious about the history of your home, Definitely go into the clerk and recorder's office, search your deeds, because that will take you all the way back through your chain of ownership, and you'll have the names. But then from there, if you can use websites like Ancestry.com, if you can jump on, and you can, the Sanborn Fire Maps, you can get on them for free on the internet, or even reach out on Facebook groups, you will be stunned at the amount of information you'll find out about your property. And like Sue was saying, there are dynamos like Lejean Greeson that have pictures upon pictures of Victor and could possibly help you in your search for your property. Um, so that being said, if you ever get stuck or you ever have questions, I put all of my contact information on the whiteboard to the right. So for anybody who's zooming in, again, my name is Frankie Ashton. So if you want to email me, that is F like Frankie, last name Ashton, A like Apple, S like Sam, H like Harry, T like Tom, O like Octopus, N like Nancy, the number seven, so it reads fashion7 at gmail.com. And I'm just bold to do this, guys, bold enough. My phone number is 719-755-2588. And feel free to contact me directly. I'm pretty quick about responding to texts and emails. So just let me know if you have questions. I'm more than happy to assist anyone in their search because I love doing this. So does anybody have any questions for me right now? Well, so we, you know, when when we became Teller County, 
What year was that then? So that was March 23rd of 1899. And I'm getting very specific because transactions that were even done in February of 1899 are technically records of El Paso. So when we split from them, they kept those records. So they are the custodians of those records. But I've had many people tell me, if you go down to their building at 1675 West Garden of the Gods, they have a really big complex over there and they have all their historical records on microfiche. So now I'm not sure how they can duplicate those or print those off. I know at Teller County Clerk and Recorder, we are readily able to print documents if you need them. So um, you might want to give them a call. They have their phone number is 719-520-6240. And so that way, if you know, hey, I like one of my houses was built in 1900. So I know there will be to get all the way back. I will have to go to El Paso and do that the rest of that search. Yes, Nancy. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, share a similar story to yours, maybe. Um, one day, many years ago, I was coming home from work, and there was a lady, uh, a car with two older ladies parked in front of the house, and I thought, hmm, this is a little odd. So I went over and I asked if I could help them, and they said, we grew up in that house. And I said, all right. And I said, uh, about when? Well, 1930s. And um, I knew a bit about the history of my house. One of my former tenants was in the And uh, I said, it was her grandmother, probably, a Mrs. Fuller. Yes. I said, so a mystery, Mrs. Fuller, owned the house from about 1900 to about 1908. And I believe that he had something to do with one of the mines here. The house, the way it was built, um, was clearly uh, nice woodwork, that sort of thing. So that led me to believe that this person probably had a little more income than the average person. And I said, and uh, Mrs. Fuller also owned this house in 1932. Yes, that's when we went to live with our grandmother. So I invited them to come in and we're starting to go through my house. And I said, you know, this is our living room. This is the dining room. And one of the ladies said, no, this isn't the dining room. This was another parlor. And she said, over there, so we have a, a wall and there's a stairway that goes up. She said, there used to be a door there. I thought, okay. So we went down and through and into the kitchen and there's a, what we use as a bedroom now. Um, she said, this was the dining room and it still has a, a swinging door. And it dawned on me all of a sudden, why the light switch for this room was clear on the other side of the room because you went through that the parlor flipped the light switch on with your left hand side to go into the dining room. And then she was telling me about, you know, there used to be a wall and there was a back porch which had the refrigerator and the washer. Uh, there was no bathroom, but I, I learned a whole lot about my house that we, we had never known before. But because I had already looked at the history of it, when these ladies showed up, it's like well, this was it was just absolutely fascinating to talk to them because things that I didn't understand before were crystal clear now. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do is go back and look to see how far back the house goes. It's down at the south end of Fourth Street. So the fire never got there. So we've hypothesized that it was built probably 1893, 1894, but it would be now fun for us to go and and actually do the research and tell it, or you know, Castle County to find out the rest of the story. But so, yeah, you'll be amazed at what you find. Even sure on deeds, thank you for letting me share. Even on deeds, I had no idea that all four sides of my house was once brick because it's described that way in the 20s, four-sided all brick house. And the same thing, I thought, boy, you are of some means if you could build a four-sided brick house in Victor, but it must have been after the fire. They must have wanted to fireproof it. Well, then finding out that Mr. Newland was a banker by trade and, and was of means, yes, he probably built the house to withstand a fire. And then I also found, going even farther back, that, and this is why I bring up loads, I see improvements there upon the apex of the Inez load. 
And I went, oh, it was on a mining claim, which made sense because they must have mined all of this land before our houses went up. And I know just from when I go down in my basement and go back up the steps, there's gold flakes on my stairs. So I know that at one point that must have been a mining claim. So to see it was really quite interesting. And people ask constantly, well, does that mean I have mineral rights? I hate to burst your bubble. <laughs> Most of us only have surface rights, meaning you have the first six inches of the topsoil, anything under that. It generally belongs to Newmont or whomever owns the gold mine at the time because they transfer those. That as well. So when every time the gold mine sells, our office gets to index about 800 to 1,000 mining claims all in one document. I mean, it's your eyes will be crossing by the end. Luckily, we have an indexing tool. It's like a highlighter, and we just go down the line and type in. But they literally transfer every single mining claim when that mine sells so that there's a paper trail for every last piece of the mine, every parcel of land up there, every active mining claim, every inactive mining claim. So it's quite interesting to kind of go back and see what has transpired over time because I learned things I never thought I would know. So for example, I believe Golden Cycle, I don't know if they owned the gold mine maybe during the 80s. They also owned Cripple Creek Mountain Estates and they subdivided it in the 70s and sold it off <laughs> like by lot by lot, but they were actually the ones who subdivided and had all the plat maps done. And if you do not know what a plat map is, that is also gonna be on your list. Every part of Victor, there is a map for. So I will go ahead and warn you guys, most of our plat maps are the originals. And so some of them we cannot upload into the computer because they're in a giant book that's sitting on the center island. And so we have no way to run them through the plotter to scan them because we would have to tear apart a 130 year old book to get these maps. Um, but the major ones, they're still in the computer, but I would tell you, you probably want them more for artwork than actual dimensions because they are so old. I've actually gone into our vault and, and pulled them out. They're extremely fragile. I mean, we're terrified to even make copies of them because we don't want to damage them. But in case you don't know, Cripple Creek and Victor, we have standard lot sizes. A single lot is 25 by 125. So if you have multiple lots, you can generally do the math. And then a lot of people that have bigger parcels, they've paid to have an independent survey done anyhow. Um, but I would at least tell you just for the fun of having the map that you can frame and put up in your house, Spicer Edition, City of Victor, they're all up at the Clerk and Reporter's office and you can have them printed off. So, yeah. And staying on the mining idea, because we know there's going to be capital issues. It's a cash shaft. More than likely, any mining property under companies. Oh, definitely. I mean, there, there would definitely be a way. So, now how that would work is you're going to want to go backwards on the capital. And fingers crossed, they are going to make mention. And at some point, they're going to call it an improvement. Because if you don't know what that is, your house is an improvement to the lot on which it sits. And that's why legal descriptions are so important. Because the way the county sees it, we don't care about your house or your physical address. We care about that piece of land. And your house has simply been a way to improve it. So if you go backwards on the tableau, if you get far enough back, much like my house, Chances are they called it improvements of Han, and then they should give you some names of mining claims. And then from there, once you have names of loads, you can look up the patents on them, you can look up the history on them. So, yes, and so that's where it gets really fascinating that they should give you the name or names because the tattoo is pretty big. There may have been more than one mining claim on that property. So, it's just something to think about. Something I did when I was researching my house was go back to the city directories. Oh, and yeah. someone could talk about that because I don't really remember exactly what I did, but I find it fascinating to find people's names and then they give an occupation in 504 mm -hmm. Victor Avenue. And it was like at one time, in one of those, I had like 10 people living there. And it's not big enough for 10 people, but it was like the boys' room and the girls' room, but it was like a, a police officer, a teacher, a nurse. So it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't, where do you get, where did I get that? Where would I have seen that? I have no idea. Some of the library. Here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, that's good to know because I thought maybe there would be a place to, yeah, to find them online. How to access them, but there's some physical directories right here. Okay. Uh, Anna, do you remember what years those directories are? Because they're pretty, it's 1910, 1912. There's um, several. There might be older. There's yeah, there's a bunch. Yes. The little red books. They're on, they're on Audubon online. Uh, online? I think Colorado Springs Library has a lot of them. Yeah, well, if I'm not mistaken, I also think they're on the Victor Heritage Society website. Is Doug there? Yep. Ask Doug if you have those directories there. Do you have a link to the directory, Doug? I have a link to the directories um, that are in the Victor Library and the Cripple Creek Library. Oh, yeah. perfect. The Cripple Creek link Library as well. Yeah. And the Pikes Peak Library District has a vast collection and they're very helpful. If you need to go in there for any kind of information, the librarians can help you. They're, they're genealogists. And, they can, and where's not, that? Not for property necessarily, but for everything. So where's that? Um, it's right downtown off of uh, Cascade. Yeah, Penrose Library. Oh, okay. Right Springs. Down there, right downtown. Mm -hmm. It's on Cascade. Cascade. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. Before I down, I wanted to mention when you go to the assessor's office and you have to do that's what they'll give you. If you want to go beyond that, you have to ask them, would you please search it and get the full record from the vault? And they'll go into the vault and then they'll get your way back instead of just what that paper might only go back to 1985 or so, what they originally did. Well, thank you, Steve. That's actually a good tip. Because that so there is an old vault in the assessor's office as well. And they have just like clerk and reporter, they have a handwritten record so that they can go back and reference. Also, whatever you're going to, you go back and you're just really current along, you're finding everything backwards, like Frank was saying. Then all of a sudden, you come to the sheriff's sale. And that shuts you down right now. And you can't go back any further unless you go talk to Linda. Maybe she could, sometimes she's helped me get the assessor's office there. And we've gone back. She goes into the vault into the other room, you know, down the hall towards the entrance of the courthouse. She'll go in that vault and she's got paperwork in there and, and it'll help you find it. But the sheriff's sale is if the property owner didn't make his payments and it went back to the bank or the county or whoever and, and then they put it up for auction. And, but when you hit that, you really come to a dead end. And do you have any recommendations? Yeah, and I will tell you why that happened. So I'm guessing it's a state statute thing because those are typically handled by the Teller County Treasurer. So just like you see those uh, treasurer's deeds, so if you get back behind on your taxes by three years, the county can sell your property. Um, we see it a lot with vacant land. People inherit land and live out of state and just forget to pay the the property taxes three years in a row, well, then someone else can come in and buy it. Or we see public trustees deeds. And unfortunately, that's what happens when your house is foreclosed on. With those sheriff's deeds in modern days, we now record them for public record. But in those older ones, you may even want to go talk to Sharon at the treasurer's office. Their old volumes of books, because they have books just like Clerk and Recorder does, but they keep them down in the lower level of the um, courthouse, down in the basement level. And I believe, however, they charge by the hour to go down and research those books. So for whatever reason, way back when, those were not the Clerk and Recorder's records. Those were specific to the treasurer. But now we, anything that they do over there, we record on the public side because now we realize, hey, people are gonna to need to research this in a hundred years. We're going to need to have record of this. Um, and I will also tell you guys, unfortunately, um, in about 2009, we sent off a lot of those big books and our drawer and card system from the 70s to a third party vendor to have them scanned, not all of our books came back to us. 
So we, yes, believe me, if I could go back in time and find out who that was, I would knock on their door and say, I believe you have our property. But a, a few of our giant books did not come back to us. And then quite a bit of our drawer and card volumes from the 1970s did not come back. So unfortunately, there are records that were just lost. And please know that is no, through no fault of the county other than hiring the wrong third party vendor to scan those documents because I don't think they understood how important they really were and how vital they were to be back in our office. And the whole reason we hang on to those records is so that as years change, as software changes, we can rescan those documents at higher resolutions, replace the images in the computers. We can do fun stuff like background drops, take the speckles off the maps. So we're kind of OCD about hanging on to originals, especially maps so that we can keep producing that image because we know how important it is to have those. So um, yeah, just something to note. Sometimes when you hit a dead end, that's because generally the clerk and recorder's office is not staffed to, to do research. But if you hit a dead end, Steve knows better than anyone. Steve and I have worked together many, many years. And he can just say, walk up the camera, like, can you go grab one of the recorders? And someone will come out and do the search and then even go on the backside because the computers that the recorders are on are even in more, in more depth than the ones on the public facing side. And so we will search every way we know possible and then we'll figure out just from working there like, oh, it's during that date range, darn it. That is that volume that didn't come back to us. And then you can even see in the books, they're numbered by the way. And so there are, no, there are numbers, there are <coughs> volumes that are just gone. And those are the books that didn't come back to those us. The so. ones that people I researched, it's always the one that's not there. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize for that. But yeah, for the most part though, you can really, and that's why I say if you use multiple avenues, if you use ancestry.com, you use city directories, you use those old Sanborn fire maps, you can find a way, I mean, I couldn't believe what I found in census records because then that got me even renters. Because keep in mind, as I'm saying buyers and sellers, that implies that the person bought the property. That doesn't tell you if maybe there were people who rented that house for 10 years, you won't know about them because they didn't own the house. So that's where I say the more that you, more searches you can do, the better. But on the clerk and reporter side, Less is more on the computer search. I always tell people, if you just put a name in there, you'll probably get a better shot than going in and trying to put their name, the legal description, then add a physical address. Because by the way, we don't record by physical addresses. The, the way we see it, the post office uses your, your address, your physical address. We do not. We use the legal description of the property. So we have, and so people panic, like, I can't find my deed. And then I look at the computer and I'm like, oh, well, let's delete this, 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 and this and do a search. Oh, there it is. It's the first document. It's because you've put in criteria that we don't necessarily make that document searchable by. And it performs what's called a wild card search. And so if you overload it with information, it'll, it, it, the computer will just be like, no, I'm sorry, I can't find this particular document with all of this criteria. But if you simply give a name or, or leave a name out and just put a legal description in, then you'll get more hits as far as documents that come back. And then that list that you got, now you know how to lead through those documents and go, oh, I don't want this, I don't want this, I do want this. Because it'll give you a way better understanding of chain of title, but unfortunately we have to record it all. Every little thing that happens with a property gets recorded and people don't realize that even when you refinance your property it gets recorded there's record of it so yes sir um oh i was just seeing, i lost my train of thought for a minute but frank and them they really go out of their way to help you and they're amazing they over and cook great doing that and if you do have to go down to colorado springs it's a whole different world down there compared to <laughs> visiting frank you're going to go in there you're going to go register you're going to sit in a chair until they call you, and then you'll tell them, then they'll give you the film you want, and you go sit at a computer, and it's real dark, or it's real light, and pretty soon you find yourself skimming through just to get to a better page, and 
It's very difficult in the spring, so hopefully none of you will have to go down there. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's so much easier to look at the actual book. Yeah. But, and then also I want to say, doing research, Ancestry.com is incredible. I, I got like 750 family trees. And if you want to find, say, your house, for example, and you know, well, the person that lived there that you mentioned earlier, if you go back and start a family tree on them, or your house, or your house, or whoever, start a family tree on them, and look for their descendants, and you can find that through the obituaries you'll get on Ancestry. You can see uh, survivors. And anyways, I've written over the years letters, countless letters to people just fishing, so to speak. Explain who you are, and I would sure be interested in any photographs you might have if you do have any. And every now and then you hit the jackpot. And boy, over the years, I've gotten tons of photographs just from Ancestry.com mm -hmm. and, and finding these descendants and writing a letter to them. And they were happy to send you pictures. Or you can even write on the Ancestry site, though you'll find pictures they've already posted of your old house back in 1930 or whatever. So Ancestry is really handy. Yeah, that's good to know. I'd like to take a minute because I want to tell you, was it three years ago we did the World War II Memorial um, yeah, so in like Wallace that. Park? So the original, um, and I think there were 400, I want to say 437 names, but a little over 400, 427. And so, when um, they were going to paint the Monarch building and we were gonna do the memorial in Wallace Park, LaGene Greeson and Steve Cruz did all this underlying research and we are up to how many? It's 800 and some names now. And they're all the veterans from that um, were drafted or enrolled when they were in Teller County during World War II. So, um, the names expanded and, and Steve did a lot of research on individual soldiers and um, or servicemen. And um, so thank you, Steve, for doing that. I, you know, I just wanted to and let Jean, you know that. And Lejean, Lejean on the upper left. <laughs> so, I mean, that kind of took a life on of its own, didn't it? When that started. So uh, that was exciting. And the, the memorial is down in Wallace Park. It's the three-sided memorial. Also, I want to tell you that the Victor Heritage Society awards a landmark award. And it was um, inactive probably for about, I'm going to say four or five years, maybe. Yeah. Uh, especially like through the COVID time. So we um, want, what that is, it's, and if you drive around, Judy has one on her house on Victor Avenue, but it says, what does yours say? It has um, the original, as far back as I could go, and then our name, and then the year it was built, and then I think it just says Heritage Society of Landmark Awards. Something. And it's a real nice wooden plaque. And uh, there's Annie Kennedy has one on Second Street here but several houses have them. And uh, if people do the research on their house and that all gets put out on our webpage, correct, Doug? Yes. And yes. so go to the Victor Heritage Society webpage and see which houses have been awarded that landmark award. And it gives all the history, it's really cool. And, and what we do is we look for homes or buildings that have preserved uh, the historic uh, look of the house and maintain it following these guidelines. We don't make you do that, but we can't, yeah. but. Integrity. Yes. Historic integrity. They, they maintain the historic integrity, yes. Anything else? If anybody has stories to share or questions? I do. <laughs> I'm Maggie, and this is Randy, and we're just new to Goldfield. And we have been on Facebook and 
saw some pictures that someone posted of a really cool house. Didn't know where it was, and we thought maybe it might have been ours, which it wasn't. <laughs> but it looked like it could have been. Was that just in the past? Just mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it turned out to be Frankie's neighbor. <laughs> we just met her, Frankie, here at the oh the Purple Heart ceremony. Yeah. But anyway, Randy had said, Are you sure that maybe it isn't this one? And I can't remember the gentleman's name, nope. And so in the process, we met the gene who amazingly sent us all kinds of cool stuff about our house. We thought it was built in 1916, 1898 it was built. Lots of really neat old pictures and history of the gentleman that built the home. That was a... Uh, she kept flooding. Uh, you, <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you won't believe this. Yeah. Listen, you know your house. We just I love it. And when we saw that you had posted this, that's, you know, we want to get more involved and learn more about our house. But to just say hi to people because we're kind of new neighbors. Welcome. Oh, oh, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> thank you. We love it up here. And I moved here when I was 10 years old from Chicago. And when my mom and I drove up here the first trip, I told her, Mama, one day I'm going to live up here. <laughs> It took 50 plus years. <laughs> so, thank you, Regine. And I can't remember Doug, I think was another person's name. And yeah. there were just a bunch of people just letting us the call. It was my pleasure. She said it's her pleasure. Thank you. That's what I have to say. Yeah. Well, what she just said, it's not uncommon in my findings. Anyway, it's the assessor's office is. Many times on wrong dates of when the building was constructed. So well, and I think that again, all of this is structured now and it's all by state statute. Everything the assessor does, everything the organ recorder does. But heaven really knows a hundred years ago what that looked like a hundred plus years ago, if maybe they weren't required. So my goals is I'm going to go down to Teller County's building and planning department in Woodland Park and ask for my master file just to see how far back it would go, what kind of information I can find there. Um, because for people with newer homes in Teller County, they have right down to the blueprints of your house whenever the building permit was pulled. So I'm kind of interested so I can kind of speak intelligently to everyone else go down there myself and pull my master file and see exactly how far back that goes. Um, but if I had to take an educated guess, much like when Victor was platted, they were throwing up miners' cabins before they could even get the maps made. So you'll notice there's houses that overlap or over, they encroach on each other's lots. It's because there was such a rush to get these houses built that they were not waiting until the proper channels were completed, whereas now it's completely different. If you're you go to build a house, there's going to be all kinds of permits, you have setbacks, there's you can't just throw a house on a property line anymore. But people were doing that in 1892. Um, so if I had to take an educated guess, I think that maybe there was not statute surrounding that, and so there was misinformation, things got modge podged. And so now part of the assessor's job is cleaning up those old records. So that's why I want to present them with an actual, I don't want to say an argument, but a case for, hey, there's actual, here's pictures of my house from 1902. Here it is on a Sanborn fire map from 1900. I believe we have that build date incorrect. So definitely I would say there's room for error there. Mine was something like that. When I first purchased the house, the date said it was 1900. Mm -hmm. When I refinanced a couple of years later, it said 1905. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the interesting thing is your lender generally would go by the assessor's records. Typically, lenders will do a search. If they're doing any, if they're, especially if you're closing through a title company, the title company is going to go through clerk and recorder's records and the assessor's records and report back to the lender. So especially if they're trying, just they need all of that information to calculate the proper value of your house. So if I had to guess, maybe there was a miscommunication there, or 
if, if you look at the assessor's website, I wouldn't be shocked if there was an adjusted year built somewhere and maybe somebody with speed rating, because it's a lot of information. It gives your total square footage, your bedrooms, your bathrooms. You scroll down and it'll give you your last several years of property tax amounts. So if somebody is just trying to get that deal closed and they're just quickly perusing, it's very easy to either fat finger on a computer. I've done it myself. That's why there's always a second set of eyes to check my work because I've been ten, typing on 10 key and accidentally put a number in incorrectly. So it could be something that simple too. I'm, I'm like with Nancy, I'm just a couple houses down from Nancy. So now I'm starting to wonder maybe it isn't older than I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also, I'm looking at the Sheriff's Office website. Mm -hmm. And it's not Yeah, and then with the great fire happening, yes. it's how many houses went up after and how big of a rush was there to rebuild town after the fire. So kind of like you said, Nancy, did they maybe just round up to 1900 because we split after January 1st? Or did truly a ton of houses go up in 1900 because they were rushing to get to rebuild residential after the fire? Yeah, because most of the downtown was rebuilt well, the fact that the last fire was um, August 21 of 1899, and by the middle of February, the downtown was rebuilt. And the council at that time decreed every building in the downtown area would be either brick or stone because they were not going to suffer another fire. Does they anyone, had one in 1896. Does anybody know where all that brick came from? Yeah. Did they know so? There's a brick foundry over on Millsap Creek. All and Millsap's that old creek that comes down and um, sort of parallels the top end of Wilson. If you go out Bennett Canyon Road, you know where we go over in Reed's Corral, uh -huh. is out there on the old hillside. If you go down into the creek valley there and up the other, there's still um, some broken brick there. Um, there were used to be big piles, but a lot of it got hauled back in the victory to repair it. And that brickyard operated until sometime in the teens. And um, after Victor was rebuilt, people who owned it um, were hauling brick in and putting it on the rail and sending it to Colorado Springs. And they had the two guys who owned it had a wagon wreck. Um, on that gully that comes down this side of Straub Mountain, and they were both killed. And um, Carl Roy said until the 30s or something, you could still see the remains of the wagon right there. Wow. And then it closed. But it was all done really quickly. And it's all soft brick, which is why the buildings had issues there. Yeah, because it wasn't fired. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know the Washington School was catty corner from this building, mm -hmm. right on this corner. And Washington School was not destroyed in the fire, but everything between the Washington School over to the Presbyterian, I think it was the Presbyterian Church uh, west of town. Do you know, Betty? That was all just destroyed completely. That's the Methodist Church. Methodist Church, okay. <clears throat> so it's amazing it yeah. all didn't go really. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever made a map of what was destroyed? Yes. Um, Lejean, do you want to talk about that? Um, that in, in fact, it was a Gold Rush Days booklet. Uh, yes, it was the 1999. Uh, Gold Rush Days booklet that Ruth did the 100th anniversary of the fire. And it's all about Josiah Appleton Small and his experience. Uh, his wife was out of town, so he wrote her, I believe, three different letters, but one was written the night of the fire. And he said it went from Washington School to the Methodist Church. Those did not burn. And anything from Portland up above the uh, Midland Terminal Railroad. So there's kind of a 
rectangular area that uh, designates where the fire burned. But I'm sure on some of the edges, like if there was a house or a building, you know, it might not be an exact rectangle. But his his uh, his letter was very very interesting. And if anyone wants to email me, I can email the article to them. Uh, and my email address is Hansville, H-A-N-S-V-I-L-L-E, 98340 at gmail.com. Interesting. I actually know the lady that is related to his wife. Uh, she's a descendant of that side of the family. She has a website that also has that information on it. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, Steve's got questions. <laughs> if you'd like to take a chance on finding an old photograph of your house at the assessor's office, on the far end of the photograph, yeah. photograph this little one's like K big or so, but I found them as late or as far back as the late 1940s pictures of buildings and businesses. So you might luck out and find an old photograph of your house from the 50s or so. No, that is a good tip because uh, when I had mine pulled, there was it was only from the eighties, but still it was neat to see the house yeah. even in the eighties. So the mm -hmm. trees are only this high. Yeah. <laughs> where, where are those photos again? Go ahead, Doug. Where are those photos again? Oh, is that the assessor's office. Yes, the Teller County Assessor. Yeah, I've been in your vault. I know about those old books. <laughs> for time they thought I worked there. <laughs> I just told them not to not to lock me in. Oh no. <laughs> um, they were very, I think you were under renovation in those days. And I was over there so much they just said, oh, go on back and help yourself. And um, those are a lot of good shortcuts to the stuff that's in the clerk and uh, clerk's office, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> And Frankie, for you, like going down to Woodland to research yourself, don't forget about Fidelity. Oh, yeah, they Steve Elak with Fidelity. Yeah, Steve's retired. He's now working independently, though, as a yes, consultant. Yes. So, <laughs> like, I still and have so Steve's number. He still has access, but they got an amazing collection there. They really do. He worked really hard for years and years. So, yeah, Fide Fidelity National Title down at Woodland Park. There was a dynamo that worked there for decades and he collected a great number of records. In fact, there have been, you know, how we've lost some books over the years. We would call Steve at Fidelity and he'd be like, hey, I've got a copy. Do you want me to email it? I'm like, yes. That's what I do. I so, it there, I yeah, that's another one to think about for sure. So he's open to people asking. Well, I'm not sure what his replacement's like. I haven't been in there, have you? Um, they're okay. They're still learning. I mean, come on. He it took how many decades did it take Steve to amass that out? You know what I mean? But all of those records are still there, and he's organized them in such a way that even his replacement can can go in and find those as well. Yeah, just a totally amazing, amazing collection. Yes, definitely. Anyone else? <laughs> okay. Let's let's thank Frankie. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, be sure and write down her contact information and uh, please stay around. There's water, cookies, coffee, decaf coffee, but thank you guys for coming. Um, the calendars are out there if you're interested, membership forms for the Heritage Society and keep watching Facebook and however you found out about this word of mouth for other um, opportunities to participate because we got a lot of we got a very busy schedule this summer all around town so that's pretty cool and thank you for everybody that shared the information yeah so this was a great turnout before we go i don't know if it's data or us but uh bruce davis left me some uh plots from early victor insurance company Oh, no, that was interesting. Stuff like that. I bought it here. He's trying to place the amount people can look at. 
So you want can you you want to introduce yourself? I'm not sure most people know you. I know who you are, but you're can't oh sorry. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself so we know who you are? Yeah, I'm Charlie Lewis. I live in Bruce Davis's house called the Timber Park, but I live there. I'm number nine South Side. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you guys. I want to say hi to the team. Oh, here. Come on over. Hi, Steve. How are you? It's going good. Go. How's it going? It's going pretty good. Can't complain. <laughs> I'll see you later. Okay, take care.